Right, and as we end Mental Health Awareness Month, Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty, or also known as WILL, has the first of its three new reports titled Frame Connections, Exploring Social Capital and Its Societal Implications. That is out now. There's two more coming. And it's a unique look at declining mental health, violence, and loneliness, and how they're all contributing causes at the root of a lot of our societal problems. And so here to discuss the findings of uh, that are specific to Wisconsinites, our mental health, and how it's having a ripple effect throughout our community are the uh, report's authors, Will Flanders and Miranda Spint. Welcome. Yes, I said it right. Spint? <laughs> yes. Yeah, Spint. Um, sorry, you give me a look, and I was like, oh, no, did I say it wrong? No. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Yes, Thanks thank for you. Being here. So my first question is, lowering the temperature of some of the more divisive issues of the day is not necessarily what I would say Will is known for. <laughs> and I think when people think of what headlines come out as far as lawsuits that you guys are usually doing, it's more on things that we're fighting about. And so this is something that I think we can actually all agree on is that there is that loneliness is a problem. So what? how does this fall under the purview of what Will does? Yeah, it's a great question, a question we've heard a lot as we've gone through this process. I think you know the key for us is that while we do get involved in a lot of controversial issues, um, we always try to recognize that you know we we ought to be able to talk to folks, right? We ought to be able to talk to people on the other side, um, have conversations. And what we see, you know, across the board, even before we, we began this research, is obviously with the tenor of polit- political debate today, uh, that's not something that we see happening very much. So uh, that was sort of the entree into this uh, issue: is you know how do we get back to where we can interact with people? How do we restore those social connections? And this first report, as we'll discuss, uh, you know, looks at what the real, the very real consequences are of, of not having those connections that are not just sort of in our political world, but also in our mental health and, uh, and physical health as well. So we mentioned before, kind of jokingly, that loneliness is not a partisan issue. So what did you, what similarities, I guess, did you find as you started this, as you started? Sure. So clearly, um, loneliness is not something that Only liberals or conservatives care about this and that affects all of us. We felt that this was important to talk about, especially after the pandemic. Uh, Loneliness has been getting worse. The um, mental health issues such as anxiety, depression have been worsening even since before the pandemic. But the pandemic really stripped us from our communities pretty forcefully. And it has made very clear these issues and how they've been how they've been getting worse. So. We felt that it was just really important to highlight this issue when we we were, when we were working on this report. We were trying to gather discussions from all sides of the political spectrum, from academia, from different books, historical data and that sort of thing. And just trying to bring it all together and in a way that's digestible. This is something that is very relatable for so many of us. We all feel that we aren't spending as much time with each other, that we're spending more time on screens rather than in person. And this is obviously as something we'll discuss that has greater impacts on on societal issues. And um, it's just something that we felt was important to really make digestible and understandable and relatable for people to talk about. Just real quick before we go on, what's the definition that you guys went with of loneliness? Mm-hmm. So, well, not of loneliness necessarily, but of social capital. The definition is that um, it's basically our relationships to our communities and our institutions and that are important towards a heterogeneous society so when we're all so different how is it that we can stay together and connected and still be functional essentially and work together so that's the definition we're working with and that's a it's different depending on what you're looking at who's researching the issue but that's the general idea so how did you approach taking this on was it surveys was it just um looking at academia that already like other studies that have already been done but how did you even approach trying to look into this because you would it wasn't just for wisconsin you looked across every state right yes yeah, so we've pulled literature data from all different kinds of sources from academia to published literature articles to um the joint economic committee committee has data on this that they were gathering since 2017 so pulling from all these different sources um and we didn't find anything new per se but our goal was to bring it together make it digestible understandable for people because it's something that unless you're looking for it you're not going to hear about social capital or what it is or why it's important so this is that was our goal was to just bring this all together kind of 
bring it down to earth in a relatable and understandable way. Yeah, Miranda mentions it's nothing new, right? And, and mm-hmm. this is something that was interesting to me about this topic is uh, there's an old conservative, you know, leaning book from the 1950s called The Quest for Community. And, you know, even before Robert Putnam, who some folks might be familiar with, with Bowling Alone, looked into this topic, um, what, what he argued for is that these institutions are central to societies, the fabric of society. This could be churches. This could be bowling leagues, as was, as was made f- famous by Robert Putnam. So when we think about how we approach this from a conservative perspective, it's really what's frayed in those community institutions and how do we get them back? And it isn't a new concept, but again, we've seen it's gotten worse in the last uh, couple of years since the pandemic. So in the the dissolution, I guess, or the of social capital, it affects not only the big communities, but there's effects, ripples all the way down the line, right? Absolutely. So we do, um, you mentioned this, the first of three reports. So we'll have another report coming out in the next week or so here focusing on how the decline specifically happened. And then the third report talks about solutions like you just asked about. So we do talk about different federal, state, local solutions that people could implement from encouraging more charitable giving to uh, encouraging home ownership and even just on personal levels, making sure that we are making a point of reading a book once in a while rather than doom scrolling or um, making sure you're reaching out to your friends and how these are all things that we can do together individually and collectively that can start making a difference and re- rebuilding the social capital that we've lost over the past 50, 60 years. So how did Wisconsin specifically rank on any of these different measures? Mm-hmm. So according to the Joint Economic Committee's data, Wisconsin is actually third overall st- uh, nationwide. For best, we don't for, say that. Yes, for best. Uh, <laughs> so Wisconsin, yes, so, exactly. Uh, so Wisconsin actually does pretty well. Um, but when you break it down by county, uh, you can see there's some areas for improvement. There's a few, um, like, uh, so, sorry, um, f- rural counties um, and also more low-income counties, Milwaukee, for example, that score lower in certain areas. But even then, there's um, still a lot of counties like that still score very high in other areas. So there's still room for improvement. Um, but again, it's we do pretty well overall, which is which is good news. Of course. Yeah, I think one interesting thing there is there's two, not to get too in the weeds, but there's two types of social capital. There's the bridging social capital, which are connections across economic lines or connections with folks that might come from different backgrounds. And then there's bonded social capital, which are connections within the community. When you look at urban areas, they tend to do well in the bonded social capital. And those are the connections uh, that folks have that might be so you can have someone for a babysitter. They might be someone who connects you with somebody who can get you you know, a, a new position. When you look at the bridging social capital, that's where the urban and some of the rural areas uh, tend to suffer. Suffer, um, but uh, the, the bridging is obviously maybe strongest in our what we think of the suburban counties and things of that nature. We are talking to Will Flanders and Miranda Spint, uh, who are the uh, reports authors from Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty about loneliness and its impact in our state and across the country. When we come back, I want to talk more about, I know it's not out yet, but as far as some of the solutions and how much of this is all on us and how much of this is a policy solution to get us out of here. So you're listening to Spanning the State. It's 123. <laughs> Spanning the state. I'm Brian Noonan. And I am Kristen Bry, and we are talking to Will Flanders and Miranda Spent from Wisconsin Institute for Law and Liberty on their new report, one of three, talking about loneliness, uh, its effects, where Wisconsin ranks, and in general, what we can do about the loneliness epidemic. And so I guess skipping ahead, because the the first report that is out now that you can find, is it just will.com? No, what's your will, will dash law. Oh, Mike. Oh. Hit your button there. On. On? Yeah, now it's on. Okay, sorry. There we go. That. Will-law.org is there the website. There we go. Sorry. Uh, and so the first one's called Frame Connections, Exploring Social Capital and Its Societal Implications. There's two more coming. So to kind of preview, I think what you said is the, the third one of how do you take the information that you have? Because it feels like how do you legislate fixing loneliness sure you know what i mean instead of something that takes that we have responsibility for ourselves um taking responsibility for getting off of our phones and some of the Mm -hmm. technological like technology reasons that we're maybe feeling more lonely so where is the line between advocating for self internal governance (laughs) and what we can actually do from a policy angle so the angle that we took on this was kind of looking at how can the government help encourage people to take individual action. So at the federal level, for example, we talk about introducing a a tax deduction for 
to charitable giving to help encourage more of that. Um, at the state level, we talk about reducing a few regulatory barriers for nonprofit organizations so that it's easier for them to either start up and keep running rather than that it is. We have a study in the report that shows that states with more regulatory um, barriers on their nonprofits have less of them naturally. Mm. Um, so as a way to kind of encourage more of that natural um, creation of people wanting to make change. And then at local levels, we talk about housing. So, for example, um, home ownership is a huge aspect towards encouraging better social capital. When you are a homeowner, you're more likely to stay in a community for a longer period of time compared to renting. You take a little bit more interest in the improvement of education and schools in the area for taking care of the prop- your property and surrounding properties as it increases your property value. Um, so that's one way for people to be more invested in their communities is through home ownership and ways to encourage that. Um, also, the way that we design our urban and other communal spaces, making sure that there's parks for people to gather in, that people are, that it's walkable for people to go from their office space to a place to get lunch, to going to a bar afterwards and hanging out together, those kinds of things that we can encourage through the way we develop our cities and other communal spaces. Um, and then, of course, the individual stuff, which I t- touched on earlier, which is just being aware of this issue, taking those simple steps that they seem simple but when you really think about it it feels like it takes a lot of effort to be like you know I never call my mom but I really should um, or something along those lines so that we kind of go through that whole process but again a lot of these policy things that we talk about regarding specific governmental solutions is that you can't force people to hang out together so we took the, the approach of how can we just implement policy that can encourage it better. Well, well first, I will say that a lot of it sounds like uh, good plans for people who have money. A lot of it, uh, like some of the things, you, well, if I'm giving charitably, I'm not, I don't really have to, I can give charitably and never leave the house. And I want to live in a neighborhood that has a lot of public space and walkable things. Well, that's, you know, home ownership and stuff, that all takes money. Yeah, I think uh, it's a good point, right? These aren't things that are that are uh, free, but I think one of the notions we have is we're trying to make these things more affordable for folks, right? So we have. Unfortunately, will I have to cut you off? No, no we worries. have to go to news in three seconds. ABC News and local headlines. Thanks, are next. you guys.